Chapter 2 Primordial Azeroth Reign of the Elements For many long ages, the Pantheon continued searching the cosmos for ancient titans, bringing order to countless worlds in the process. Yet, despite their efforts, they did not find any more of their kin. At times, the titans of the Pantheon wondered if their search was in vain, but always they resolved to press on. They knew in their hearts that more world souls existed, and this hope filled them with purpose. Though the Pantheon did not know it, their intuition was correct. A miraculous new world was taking shape in an isolated corner of the Great Dark. Deep within this world's core, the spirit of a mighty and noble titan stirred to life. One day, it would be known as Azeroth. As the nascent titan developed, elemental spirits roamed across the world's surface. Over the ages, these beings became more erratic and destructive. The burgeoning world soul was so vast that it had drawn in and consumed much of the fifth element, spirit. Without this primordial force to create balance, Azeroth's elemental spirits descended into chaos. Fire, earth, air and water. These were the forces that lorded over the infant world. They reveled in unending strife, keeping the phase of Azeroth in constant elemental flux. Four elemental lords, powerful beyond mortal comprehension, reigned supreme over innumerable lesser spirits. Of the elemental lords, none can match the ruthless cunning of Alakir, the Wind Lord. He often sent his elusive Tempest minions to spy on his enemies and sow distrust among their ranks. Using feints and ruses, he would pit the other elementals against one another, only later to unleash the full fury of his servants on his weakened foes. The wind would howl and the skies would darken with storms at his approach. As lightning blasted the world's surface, Alakir's whirlwind elementals would come screaming from the heavens, enveloping his foes in monstrous cyclones. Ragnaros the Fire Lord despised Alakir's cowardly ways. Compulsive and brash, the Fire Lord embraced brute force to annihilate his enemies. Wherever he went, volcanoes would burst through the world's crust, spewing forth rivers and fires of destruction. Ragnaros longed for nothing more than to boil the seas reduce the mountains to slag, and choke the skies with ember and ash. The other elemental lords fostered a deep hatred of Ragnaros for his brazen and devastating assaults. Therasen, the Stone Mother, was the most reclusive elemental ruler. Ever protective of her children, she raised towering mountain ranges to ward off her enemies' assaults. Only after they had worn themselves thin against her impenetrable fortifications would the Stone Mother emerge, wrenching open giant chasms in the earth and swallowing entire elemental armies whole. Those who survived would meet oblivion at the fist of Therasen's most powerful servants, walking mountains of unforgiving crystal and stone. The wise Neptula the Tidehunter was careful not to fall for Alakir's schemes or to commit his minions or to commit his minions to fruitless attacks against Therasen's citadels. As the armies of fire, air and earth clashed across the face of Azeroth, the Tidehunter and his elementals would divide and conquer their rivals in brilliant roots. When his foes fled, Neptulon would crush them beneath tidal waves that dwarfed even Therasen's highest mountain holdings. The apocalyptic battles between the elemental lords raged for untold millennia. Dominion over Azeroth constantly shifted between the factions, each one striving to remake the world in its own image. Yet, for the elementals, victory was secondary to the conflict itself. To them, the world's calamitous state was sublime, and their only desire was to continue their endless cycle of chaos. Coming of the Old Gods The elemental lords reveled amid the primordial bedlam until a group of old gods plummeted down from the great dark. They slammed into Azeroth's surface, embedding themselves in different locations across the world. These old gods towered over the land, mountains of flesh, 
pockmarked with hundreds of gnashing maws and black, unfeeling eyes. A miasma of despair soon enveloped everything that lay in their writhing shadows. Like gargantuan cancerous postules, the old gods spread their corruptive influences across the landscape. The lands around them seethed and withered, turning black and lifeless for leagues upon leagues. All the while, the tendrils of the old gods wormed into the world's crust, slithering deeper and deeper toward the defenseless heart of Azeroth. Organic matter seeped from the old gods' blighted forms, giving rise to two distinct races. The first were the cunning and intelligent Enraki, also known as the Faceless Ones. The second were Akir, insectoids of incredible resilience and strength. As the physical manifestations of the old gods' will, both of these races would serve their masters with fanatical loyalty. Through their new servants, the old gods expanded the borders of their remote dominions. The Enraki acted as ruthless taskmasters, employing the Aki as laborers to erect towering citadels and temple cities around their masters' colossal bulks. The greatest of these bastions was built around Isharj, the most powerful and wicked of the old gods. This burgeoning civilization was located near the center of Azeroth's largest continent. Isharj's holdings along with the other old god dominions, would soon spread across the world and become known as the Black Empire. The rise of the Black Empire did not go unnoticed by the elementals. Seeing the old gods as a challenge to their dominion, the elemental lords moved to excise the entities from their world. For the first time in Azeroth's history, the world's native spirits worked in unison against a common enemy. Alakir's Tempest joined Ragnaros' fiery servants, creating monstrous cyclones of flame. These blistering firestorms raged over the world, reducing the Black Empire citadels to ash. Elsewhere, Therasane raised jagged rock walls to coral her enemies and shatter their temple cities. Neptulon and his tidal minions then swept in, crushing the Enraki and Akir between unyielding stone and the fury of the seas. Yet, for all their fervor, the Elementals could not topple the Black Empire. No matter how many Enraki and Akir died, more and more would spawn from the old gods' putrid forms like larvae from a hive. The Enraki and the Akir engulfed the land like an unstoppable pestilence, shattering the Elementals' forms. In the end, the old gods enslaved the Elementals and their lords. Without the native spirits to counter the Enraki and the Akir, the borders of the Black Empire crept over much of the desiccated world. Perpetual twilight descended upon Azeroth, and the world spiraled into an abyss. And the world spiraled into an abyss of suffering and death. The Discovery of Azeroth Meanwhile, in the depths of the great dark beyond, Agramar continues his quest to eradicate all signs of demonic influence. His battles led him from one world to another, from one demon beset civilization to the next. Though Agramar bore the full weight of his task alone, his resolve never wavered. He believed with all his heart that Sargeras would one day return and see that the Pantheon's cause was right. It was during his long and lonely journeys that the Agrimar sensed something extraordinary. The tranquil dreams of a slumbering world soul billowing across the cosmos. The song of life led him to a world that the Pantheon had not yet discovered. A world they would later name Azeroth. Nestled within the world's core was one of Agrimar's kin, one far more powerful than any yet encountered. The spirit was so mighty that Agrimar sensed its dreams even through the din of activity that rattled across the world's surface. Yet, as Agramar drew closer to Azeroth and beheld the world, horror seized him. Void energy shrouded the world's surface like a layer of deceased flesh. From the ruined landscape rose the old gods and their black empire. Miraculously, the nation titan spirit remained uncorrupted. But Agrimar knew it was only a matter of time before it succumbed to the void. 
Agramar sought counsel with the rest of the Pantheon, informing them of his discovery. Clearly, this was proof that Sargeras had been right about the Void Lords and their plans. Agramar urged the other Titans to take action with full due haste before Azeroth was lost forever. Eonar was quick to champion Agramar's cause. She compelled the other Pantheon members to think of the world's potential. If brought to maturity, this new Titan can exceed even Sargeras' considerable might, she argued. Indeed, it would become their greatest warrior, one capable of neutralizing the Void Lords once and for all. But more than that, Azeroth was one of them, a lost and vulnerable member of their family. The Pantheon could not abandon their own sibling to the clutches of the Void Lords. Eonard's words stirred the hearts of the rest of the Pantheon. They unanimously agreed to save Azeroth, no matter the cost. Agrimar formulated a bold plan of attack. All members of the Pantheon would travel to Azeroth and purge the Black Empire that had claimed it. They would not, however, take action directly due to their colossal forms. Agrimar feared the Pantheon would irreparably damage or even kill the world soul. Instead, he proposed creating mighty constructs to act as the Pantheon's hands and prosecute their will against the Black Empire. Under the guidance of the great forge Kaz Goroth, the Pantheon crafted an army of enormous servants from the crusts of Azeroth itself. The Aesir were fashioned from metal, and they would command the powers of storm. The Veneer were formed from stone, and they would hold sway over the earth. Collectively, these mighty creatures would be known as the Titan Forged. The members of the Pantheon imbued a number of their servants with their specific likelinesses and powers to lead the rest of the Titan Forged. These empowered beings were called the Keepers. Though they would develop their own personalities in time, they would forever after bear the mark and abilities of their makers. Amon Thule gifted some of his vast abilities to High Keeper Ra and Keeper Odin. Kasgoroth bestowed his mastery over the earth and forged to Keeper Arcadus. Golganeth granted Keepers Thorim and Hoder dominion over the storms and skies. Eonar gave Keeper Freya command over Azeroth's flora and fauna. Norganon lent a portion of his intellect and mastery of magic to Keepers Loken and Mimiron. Lastly, Agrimar imparted his strength and courage to Keeper Tyr, who would become the greatest warrior of the Titanforged. With this new army molded from the world's crust, the Pantheon went to war. The time to shatter the Black Empire and free Azeroth from its malign influence had come. Wrath of the Titan Forged Led by the Keepers, the Titan Forge slammed into the Black Empire's northmost holdings. The resilience and strength of the Pantheon's armies made them an unstoppable force. They unleashed the wrath of gods upon their enemies, scouring legions of Enraki and Akir and sundering their temples. The arrival of the Titan Forge caught the old gods completely off guard. They reeled in response with these stone and metal skinned invaders, but they were determined not to lose control over Azeroth. To reassert their dominance, the old gods called upon their greatest lieutenants, the Elemental Lords. The enraged elemental lords and their minions beset the titan forge on all sides. Ever wary of fighting a unified elemental army, the keepers resolved to divide and conquer their enemies. Thus, they split their own forces and dispatched each group of titan forge to make war on a specific elemental lord. Tyr and Odin volunteered to confront the most destructive elemental lieutenant, Ragnaros the Fire Lord. Their battle raged for weeks engulfing the land in fire and magma. Yet, the Keeper's resilient metal forms kept them safe from Ragnaros' fiery onslaughts. Through sheer strength and force of will, Tyr and Odin pushed Ragnaros back into his volcanic lair in the east. In a land of boiling acid and seas and skies choked with ash, the two Keepers defeated the Fire Lord. Meanwhile, Arcadas and Freya unleashed their powers upon Theris and the Stone Mother. To protect herself and her minion, the elemental ruler retreated into the towering stone spire that she called home. 
Arcadas used his dominion over the earth to weaken the Citadel's foundations and shatter the craggy giants who guarded it. Freya then made colossal roots sprout from the ground to entangle the fortress. They wormed through the stone and crystal, buckled the Citadel's walls, and brought them down on Therasin's head. Ra, Thorim, and Hoder waged war on Alakir, the Windlord. Using their mastery over the skies and storms, they forced the Elemental Lord back to his lair among the highest peaks of Azeroth. Lightning set the heavens aflame as Alakir struggled to hold off his foes. In the end, the Three Keepers turned the Elemental Lord's own power against him, defeating Alakir atop his lofty domain. Neptulon, the Tidehunter, and his minions rushed to aid the other embattled Elemental Lords, but they were waylaid by Loken and Mimiron. The two Keepers used their wits to harry and outmaneuver Neptulian's forces at every turn. Ultimately, Loken unleashed his arcane powers to freeze and shatter the water Elemental's forms, while Mimiron crafted enchanted bonds to imprison Neptulian himself. Although the Elemental Lords had been defeated, the Keepers knew that they could not utterly destroy the beings. The spirits of the Elementals were bound to Azeroth itself. If they were killed, their corporal forms would simply manifest again in time. Ra found a solution. He set out to prison the Elementals, much as the great Sargeras had done to demons. Ra first called on aid of the gifted Titan Force sorceress Helia. They worked in concert to craft four interlinked domains within a pocket dimension known as the Elemental Plane. Ra and Hylia then banished the Elemental Lords and nearly all of their servants to this enchanted prison realm. Ragnaros and the Fire Elementals were exiled to a smoldering corner of the Elemental Plane known as the Firelands. Therasane and the Earth Elementals were locked within the crystal-lined caverns of Deepholm. Elakir and the Air Elementals were imprisoned among the cloudy spires of the Skywall. Lastly, Neptulon and the Water Elementals were sucked into the fathomless depths of the Abyssal Maw. Only a few Elementals would remain on the surface of Azeroth. With their leaders gone, these beings scattered and abandoned the war. Having contained the Elementals, the Keepers turned their attention to the Black Empire's Akiri legions. Many of the insectoids dwelled in vast catacombs that snaked beneath the surface of the devastated world. Arcadas bent the stones and soil to his will, collapsing the Akiri burrows and driving the creatures above ground. Upon emerging from their lairs, the insectoids found themselves surrounded by the Titan Forged. The battles between the Titan Forged and the Akiri proved unexpectedly vicious. In time, the Keepers destroyed most of the Akiri race. Small pockets of the insectoids, those that had tunneled deep underground, escaped the Keeper's wrath. Yet, they were too weakened to mount a counterattack. Fall of the Black Empire The victories over the Akir and the Elemental heartened the Keepers, but they knew that their greatest battles were still to come. As one, they turned their righteous gates on the heart of the Black Empire, the sprawling temple city built around the old gods, Yusharj. By toppling the most powerful Enraki bastion in Azeroth, the Keepers believed they could crush their enemies in one swift stroke. The Keepers and their allies waded through the swarm of Enraki after another as they battled their way toward the mountainous form of Yusharj. The broken and mangled bodies of Titanfort and Enraki alike riddled the landscape by the time the invaders breached the city and assaulted the old god itself. Yjars was more powerful than the Keepers had expected. It poisoned the minds of the Titanforged, drawing out their fears and darkening their thoughts. The Pantheon grew concerned that the old god would overwhelm the servants. Despite the risk of harming the world, they decided to take direct action. Amanthul himself reached down through Azeroth's stormy skies and took hold of Ishar's writhing body. With a heave of his mighty arm, he tore the old god from the crust of the world. In that moment, Ishar's gargantuan bulk was ripped apart. 
The immensity of the old god's death rattled, shattered mountain tops, and obliterated hundreds of titan forts where they stood. Ysharis was dead, but its tendrils had bored more deeply through Azeroth than Amanthul had ever imagined. In exorcising the old god from the world, he had inadvertently ripped an eternal wound in Azeroth to the surface. A volatile arcane energies, the lifeblood of the nascent titan, erupted from the scar and roiled out across the world. Horrified by this turn of events, the Pantheon realized they could not risk killing the other old gods in such a manner. The malignant creature had embedded themselves so deep into the world that tearing them out would destroy Azeroth itself. The Pantheon knew that the only course of action was to imprison the old gods where they lay and contain their evil forever. It would be a difficult task, but it would be possible with the aid of the Keepers. At the Pantheon's behest, the Titan Forge devised a plan to shatter the last vestiges of the Black Empire forever. They would battle each of the old gods directly. Once they had weakened the creatures, Arcadas would create subterranean chambers to contain them. Mimiron would then fashion colossal machineries to lock the old gods in place. When this work was done, Logan would imbue each prison with a great enchantment that would neutralize the old god's evil. With their plans formed, the Titan Forge began their campaign. Great battles tore across the land as the Titan Forge fought their way southeast to the Bastion of Enzoth. After overwhelming the old god, the keepers used their powers to encase the creature in an underground prison. Next, the Titan Forged marched southwest to the sprawling temple city that had grown around third old god Sithun. The Keepers and their allies purged swarms of Enraki before assaulting the old god itself and subduing it. Much as they had done with Enzoth, the Keepers entombed the entity beneath the earth and constructed a prison of their own devising over its form. Only one old god remained, the vicious and cunning yogg Saron. It would not fall so easily. As the Titan Force closed in on Yogg-Saron's crumbling northern stronghold, the old god unleashed the greatest of its generals, the Sithraxi. The Sithraxi were monstrous warbringers, larger and more resilient than other Enraki. They possessed great strength and brutal intellect, and their dark powers and maledictions could drive even the Titan Forge to madness. The giant, tentacle-faced Synthraxi whipped the remnants of the Black Empire into a frenzy. They swarmed the Titan Forged on all sides, thinning their ranks. By the time the Keepers and their allies reached Yogg-Zarong, their forces were greatly diminished. They found that they lacked the strength of numbers to defeat the Old God. Yogg-Zarong would have destroyed the Titan Forge completely if not for the heroic efforts of Odin. Although scarred and battered by war, Odin summoned his waning strength and inspired the Titan Forge to launch a counterattack. He commanded Loken to weave a grand illusion spell that forced the Sithraxi to see themselves and even Yogg-Zaron as the enemy. As the Black Empire's forces turned one another, Odin swooped in to cut down his confused foes. The other Titan Forge followed his lead, and together they succeeded in pacifying Yogg-Zaron. As they had done with Sithun and Nsoth, the Keepers buried the entity beneath the earth, locking it away in a monolithic enchanted prison. <laughs>